Our speaker tonight is Tracy Kidder, uh, who most of you know as, as the author of a book which won the Pulitzer Prize and the American Book Award in 1982, a book called The Soul of a New Machine, which details the, uh, the creation of a computer. Mr. Kidder tells me that this is probably the last time he will give a lecture based on the material in this book, at least in part. And I think he wants to talk uh, a little bit about other things he's now working on and has taken an interest in. Uh, Tracy Kidder was at uh, the Writers' Workshop in Iowa City from 71 to 73. He, uh, pleasantly enough to me, re no sound yet, Pat. He remembers Iowa very fondly. You can tell somebody who's, who's really sold on Iowa when you drive him back from the airport to Ames, from Des Moines to Ames, and he says, isn't the countryside beautiful? Because I, <laughs> <laughs> only a true Iowan can appreciate the landscape in that way. Uh, in, in addition to uh, his prizes, Mr. Kidder is a contributing editor to the Atlantic Monthly, and he asked me to say for the engineers in the audience that he also received the Ralph Rowe Coates Memorial Award from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, that, I hope that's meaningful to somebody. I asked him what it was, and he said it was important, so there it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're very pleased to have Tracy Kidder with us tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce him to you. So without any further introduction, Tracy Kidder. What I want to know is why is it that these great seats of American learning, you know, where we have all the technologists and scientists in the world, nothing ever works. <laughs> if, I, if I start mumbling, and you can't hear me, uh, you know, yell or something in the back. <clears throat> back in um, 1978, when I dallied in the world of computers, I heard a great deal of talk about the coming of the personal, or even cozier term, the home computer. It seemed to me then that the machine, that the uh, industry's ability to make such machines and to give them names came first. No one really seemed to know uh, what, to, what people would do with a personal or home computer. And for a while, marketeers went to pretty extreme lengths to think up some jobs for these machines to perform. My favorite was menus. These machines, <coughs> jumping Jehoshaphat, Mr. Science, as Bob and Ray used to say, would uh, yeah, actually relieve housewives of the very difficult and dangerous responsibility of planning for their family's nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is, this, is, this is a kludge. There we go. Right. But clearly the computer industry was just stalling until they hit on the right formula for selling the, uh, their machines, and now they found it. Anyone who watches TV uh, has seen the ad. A young man leaving home for college, ecstatic parents seeing him off, Cut to the uh, youth returning to very despondent parents. He's flunked out of college. If there were no voice in the ad to tell you why, you might think it was because the kid is chubby <laughs> or because he left home on a railroad train. A <laughs> uh, bit of, you know, a bit of belly uh, and uh, passenger train don't symbolize success in our age. Girl. In fact, of course, the kid's uh, corpulence and his choice in transportation are just symptoms of a deeper lack of good judgment on his, and especially his parents' part. <laughs> the kid flunked out of college, the voiceover tells you, because his parents didn't equip their home with a computer. <laughs> this is a powerful fable, playing as it does on the love of parents for their children. Evidently, this ad and others like it work. The home computers have become hot items, I'm told. They're selling like jelly beans. And I feel sure that that's at least partly because many parents, and especially ones who li know little or nothing about computers, believe that in these machines lie the secrets to success for their children. Success in school, first of all. I don't quarrel with the proposition that an educated person ought to know how to use machines that are fast becoming as ubiquitous and maybe as important in America as automobiles. It would even probably, probably be a good thing if school children actually understood something about how computers work. It's clear that in special situations, especially uh, for severely retarded children, um, Sometimes the computers can be uh, very handy. But the ad I mentioned clearly implies more than that. It implies that 
the computer has somehow become the very source of a good education, the prerequisite for one. And what about this term computer literacy, which you hear all the time these days? That term suggests a lot. It attaches a positive moral value to familiarity with the ways of computers. It suggests that being able to handle a computer is as important as maybe even a satisfactory replacement for the ability to read with discernment and to express oneself with clarity and style. But the equation of computers and education, and particularly of computers and literacy, seems to me so fundamentally shallow, false, deceptive, and if it should gain widespread acceptance, potentially cruel, that I hardly know how to begin unraveling it, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the term, this is my polemic, by the way. I'll get to some more stuff, some good stuff later. <laughs> the term literacy means to me uh, adroitness with human language. Obviously, it's not the ability to write enduring works of literature, if it were, that only a handful of people in any age could claim to be literate. But the ability to read enduring works of literature, and some not so enduring ones, and to do so with real understanding and with delight, that's part of what literacy means. It's not a simple matter. Understanding human language means understanding ambiguity and irony. It partakes of what John Keats called negative capability. That ability, as he wrote, to rest amid doubts and uncertainties without irritable gropings after fact and reason. Of all the possibilities inherent in human language, metaphor seems to me <clears throat> the most amazing and powerful. The essence of metaphor lies in multiple meanings. Metaphor is the power of suggestion. Through, through metaphor, words can be made to resonate the way a single string of a guitar, if you pluck it, makes other strings sing. Metaphor proceeds from the possibility of two things being right or true at the same time, which if you think about it is one of the more interesting facts of life. Metaphor is not a, ha a power that happens to reside in computers, but it is a power available to people who use computers, obviously. And one I might add that scientists such as Lewis Thomas, who's possessed in their own writing. What I'm complaining about here is not, the co not computers or all of the ways in which people use them or the people who build them. I'm complaining about advertising and the powerful and inane messages being spread about computers in order to sell them far and wide to people who don't really have any use for these machines. I feel especially cantankerous <clears throat> and about to be bored by the uh, language that's being used to punch, punch up the already wildly inflated mystique of the computer. Um, I wrote a, this book a few years ago about a team of computer engineers. I, I was very interested in the machine that they were building, but to me, it became the setting, the intellectual landscape of the story I wanted to tell. I was trying to write about people mainly, people who were doing something uh, more difficult and interesting and challenging, I think, than playing games of solitaire with user-friendly machines. <laughs> user-friendly. If it weren't probably unconstitutional to do it, I'd ask for a moment of silence to contemplate that term, user-friendly. <laughs> what does it mean uh, that, a, that a given computer is easy to use? What does it imply? The machine has human qualities, very important ones indeed. Uh, of course, the computer is no more capable of being friendly to a user than a Parisian shopkeeper is capable of being friendly to a tourist. <laughs> It's just advertising, uh, of course, but I don't like the term user-friendly because it debases the meaning of the word friendly when you sort it all out. <laughs> user-friendly suggests that the quality of friendliness lies in sheer utility. When I was hanging around with computer engineers, I found some of their shop talk charming. Um, it seemed to me that they used the specialized language of their trade in inventive ways. Look at how many terms human beings have taken from the trade of house building and applied elsewhere, terms such as square or level or going against the grain. It seemed to me that these engineers stood, the, stood near the very beginning of some analogous process. <clears throat> and I was charmed because in their application of machine-oriented terms to situations of everyday life and also to the old eternal questions about God and man, uh, I thought I saw a surfacing of the human tendency to invent and play with language. Their talk seemed fresh in a world that could be stifling, like most worlds. But computer talk has gone around the bend now. <clears throat> it's become unexamined language. Interface, a term usually used incorrectly, 
I'll, I'll do that myself in a minute. <coughs> <laughs> has become, I think, the equivalent of such ready expressions as have a good day. <laughs> you know, bank tellers have to say that or else they get punished. <coughs> and and when, I, when I really hate, I hear you. <coughs> this is language employed as a substitute for caring whether the person you're talking to has a good day or not. <coughs> it's language used to disguise the fact that you haven't really heard that you're not, in fact, interfacing with anyone. <coughs> Covering up is what's involved in those terms now, it seems to me. The term computer literacy falls into the same category. Let's consider for a moment that new machine, the Apple Computer Company's Macintosh. Well, already, just in the name, cuteness approaches. <coughs> the ma machine itself has all these neat little buttons with uh, pictures on them. Um, if you want to erase something, you push the one that has a trash can drawn on it. <laughs> Welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons. <coughs> Here's a machine designed to treat everyone if you'll forgive the anthropomorphization as a child. <clears throat> it's as silly and, a, and as obnoxious to me as Muzak. You ever, <laughs> you ever hear a carpenter talk about a McHammer or a McScrewdriver? <laughs> <clears throat> the Macintosh, what's going on? I, I think it's mainly just a pathetic attempt at wittiness, at the playful use of language for the purpose of entertainment, something that truly literate people accomplish with ease. But I think what's being sold is the illusion of humanness in the machine, and with it, the dangerous illusion that in manipulating the computer, you're involved in a real exchange, the sort of exchange that human beings carry on with each other through natural language, but a much safer and easier exchange because the machine really can't talk back, <coughs> can't offer friendliness. The Macintosh isn't friendly in any real sense. It offers the second-rate friendliness of a certain convenience and usefulness because I gather it really is a pretty good computer, which brings me to the issue of quality in my polemic, uh, a central issue in what has been misnamed the computer revolution. Last year, I happened to sit through dinner with a gaggle of authors, all of whom had written books having something or other to do with computers. They talked heatedly with great excitement about the computerized means they were using to write about computers, about all the amazing ways in which you could record and edit your prose and then transmit it to a publisher, and how very revolutionary all of this was. Not once, however, not even in passing, did any of those authors talk about the contents of their books. <clears throat> no one seemed remotely interested in the question of whether all those sentences, paragraphs, and pages, which through the wonders of high technology could now be concocted and put into print with blazing speed and maybe even some savings in cost, were worth reading. I realize this is an old complaint, but when people talk about the information revolution for which the computer presumably serves as Che Guevara, <coughs> I keep wondering you know, information about what? I think it's pretty clear that our ability to spew out information through computerized means has already far outstripped our ability to come up with information that's uh, worth anybody's time to bother about. Word processors. I know writers, good writers, who swear by them, and I feel sure that writers who work against tight deadlines can use them to good effect. Word processors can give daily journalists, for instance, the power to do re revisions, a luxury many could not afford before. I'm suspicious, though. I bought an electronic typewriter not long ago, a sort of halfway word processor. I, I used it to write a second draft of some stuff, and it lived right up to its advertisements. It allowed me to turn out a much neater second draft than I'd ever produced before, and it really did increase the speed with which I rewrote. But looking back at that draft, which needs a lot of further rewriting, I find that I don't care that the typing's neat. That doesn't matter, because a neatly typed manuscript is easily bought but one that deserves to be typed perfectly, that's harder to come by. As for the speed, I think this new typewriter lets me type too quickly. I need my second, third, and fourth thoughts, as you've gathered by now. <laughs> and, I, and I was so enchanted with the machine and so involved in writing into it that I didn't have many of those. It's, it's not a fault in the design of the machine, obviously. It's just a matter of learning how to use it or adapting to it the way uh, fine carpenters adapt to their tools. There's a larger point, though. What, what the, the computers known as word processors really have to offer our society, increased production of prose in the main, more stuff in print, but not better stuff. <clears throat> Shakespeare, we were told, wrote Hamlet in a few weeks, but it wouldn't really matter if it had taken him 15 years. To put it another way, I've resigned myself to the fact that electronic typewriters and the like 
won't enable me to write Hamlet, not in three weeks, not in 15 years. I believe that compared to the invention, which is the English language, the invention called a computer is a paltry thing. Literacy, real literacy to me, is to me the ability to revel in our native tongue, and any number of utilitarian arguments can be framed for acquiring literacy of that sort. But utilitarian arguments aren't necessary. Literacy gives a person access to the best that humanity has known and thought, a reward that is sufficient in itself. So I believe that the difference between the ability to operate a computer even one that isn't especially user-friendly. And a mastery of the English language is the difference between knowing how to do something and knowing why you want to do it. So much for my polemic. Uh, if you can stand it, I would like to change the subject and talk for a while about the residue of my experience about what I really care about, not the using of computers or the ever-growing heap of nonsense being spoken about them, but the making of things, <coughs> specifically the building of a computer and the building of a house. Um, a few years ago, I spent my time watching computers build a new computer, and last summer, I watched some carpenters put together a new house. <coughs> Don't ask me why. I'm not sure. I have the feeling, though, that the combination of experiences ought to be edifying. Obviously, the two undertakings of building a house and building a computer are very different. Um, there is, for instance, I think a greater calmness in the carpenter's approach than in the engineer's, and I think that has something to do with tradition. <laughs> the basic principles of the automatic digital computer were laid down in the 19th century, but the technology is really much younger than that. In computer engineering, history gets scrunched. Everything's speeded up uh, in the, as in the by now uh, hackneyed gimmick of time-lapse photography. Remember the Walt Disney movies? That where you saw roses bloom in 25 seconds, that sort of thing. Um, the engineers I know sp would speak of a 10-year-old computer as ancient. <clears throat> a lot of the primary tools the engineers used uh, were as new or almost as new as the machines they were trying to build. It was different. It's different with carpenters, it really is. I was asking one, a very thoughtful intellectual carpenter, uh, the sort of person who constantly analyzes his own thoughts and then sometimes analyzes his analysis, uh, I was asking him to explain his obvious affection for his tools, and he held up aloft his 22-ounce framing hammer and gave it a shake and said something about function following form. Uh, his hammer incorporates big improvements in the fastening of the head to the handle, but otherwise is nearly identical to the Roman claw hammer, which really is an ancient device. Um, anyway, the differences between computer and house building are as uh, numerous as you'd expect. What interests me most are the similarities and of these, I'm most taken by the fact that both the engineers I observed and the carpenters I've been following around seem at bottom a little otherworldly, uh, spiritually motivated toward their tasks. There's something poignant about both teams, I think, and something rather admirable in that poignance. And to explain these impressions to myself, I have a sort of theory about how in America, at least, one pattern of technological change can affect opportunities for practicing craftsmanship. And now I'm going to tell you an awful lot more than you probably wanted to hear about houses, but I'll get back to the computer engineers soon. Modern house construction really begins in the 1830s when the population of Chicago uh, swelled to several hundred souls. <coughs> building uh, in an old style, uh, there was a fellow, he wanted to build a warehouse, building in the style then prevalent, style I'll call post and beam. Uh, the fastenings were all made of wood. And at the joints, wood is removed. To keep the joints strong, you need relatively massive timbers. So the would-be warehouse builder found that, that such large timbers weren't rel relatively av readily available around Chicago anymore. So he built his building out of thin pieces of timber instead, spacing the timbers closely together. And here's an important point, fastening those pieces of wood together with nails there had been nails before, of course, for centuries. The ancient Chinese were very clever in making nails, and the Romans were too. But until the 19th century or late 18th, nails were rather scarce and expensive. Some indication of that lies in the wills left behind by the English carpenters of Massachusetts Bay. A lot of these documents uh, say, in effect, I bequeath my, to, my, to my heirs my 1,000 nails. <clears throat> I don't know how many nails went into that warehouse in Chicago, but in uh, building a modern single-family house of, say, 2,000 square feet, 
a thousand nails would barely get you started. The fellow in Chicago, documents show, had kegs of nails at his disposal, and you could argue that he couldn't have built as he did if techniques for manufacturing nails hadn't already been developed. This is a significant moment in the history of building. Architectural historians now apparently agree that this Chicago builder was the first, uh, this Chicago building was the first balloon framed structure, and balloon framing is the direct antecedent of the framing technique in widest use today. You can argue, as some do, that here in the coincidence of a new framing idea and the existence of manufactured nails lies an essential underpinning of suburbia, of the veritable land reform movement that began after World War II, the, the attempt to put the largest, large majority of Americans in houses of their own, uh, an attempt for which I think we have yet to feel all the consequences. <clears throat> but that's off my subject. One other effect. <laughs> it usually said of the rise of balloon framing was to reduce the difficulty of the house building craft. You didn't need to be able to fashion those complicated wooden joints anymore. All you need to know needed to know was how to pound nails. And that's not such an easily acquired ability as any of us amateurs have learned so vividly through our thumbs, but it's not one that requires a long apprenticeship either. So it's sometimes argued that balloon framing made the dream of owning a house realizable for millions. <coughs> um, more people could become competent carpenters than before. I wouldn't want to push the point too far, but it's clear that while framing a house is still pretty complicated, only the worst sort of duffer can build a structure that won't stand for at least 20 years. You can do a pretty shoddy job of framing and nail plywood on it, and it'll stand because nails are strong and plywood has immense tensile strength. <laughs> you could say a lot of the same things about a computer. Um, if it works, if it works adequately, then the user probably won't know or care about the elegance or lack of it in the machine's innards. Um, it may make a difference in the machine's performance, but it probably won't be the, the determining factor in that machine's commercial success. The people to whom the hidden elegance or lack of it matters mainly are the uh, connoisseurs, and especially the builders. Um, back to houses. <laughs> well, almost nobody in America stays in the same house for 20 years now. but. So that the, and the framing of a house doesn't show. Moreover, in the usual situation, a builder pays an economic penalty for taking more than merely adequate t pains with the framing. Uh, in one usual situation, a builder works for a set price which he'll receive no matter how much it actually costs to erect the building. That's the deal the carpenters I was watching had with their customers. So the faster they framed and the fewer materials they used, the more money they'd make. I watched them frame their house. I won't bother you with the details, but I hope you'll believe me when I say that they were fussy. They claimed that fussiness would pay, a nearly perfect frame would make the finish easy to apply, and there was some truth in that, but they went far beyond such considerations, I think, and eventually they acknowledged that. One of them said to me rather sadly, we try to be businesslike, but I guess we're really in it because we like it. The difference between their house and a, a, and a shoddily framed one might be that theirs should stand 200, maybe 300 years. That's not a difference that uh, many people would care about. Après moi, let it collapse. Really, only the carpenters care. They're, they're fussy for their own sakes. But it does matter. Taking care over things that don't show is part of what makes it possible for them to get out of bed on a fine summer morning and want to do what they have to do in any case, which is to go to work. The building of this particular house began with a skirmish or fight between the carpenters and their customers. Very <coughs> typical sort of thing. And the issue was complicated, but essentially it boiled down to $660, which was one forty thousandth of, thousandth of the total cost of the house. The, the customers wanted the contract price to be $660 less than the carpenters proposed. The carpenters gave in bitterly. I won't get as good a house, said one. <laughs> <laughs> About, about two months later, the carpenter who said that ordered the mason to add a tasteful, comely flourish to the chimney cap, a flourish no one had asked for, a flourish that the carpenters paid for. After the argument over $660, one of the carpenters, um, a scion of a Yankee craftsman, declared, they'll get a good house, we just won't give them anything. Every day for the next two and a half months, this carpenter mentioned that $660. <laughs> he talked about it as money that had been taken from him and his partners. Usually he mentioned that sum while performing some task, some nice touch, not required by the contract. <laughs> um, it's not, the, the carpenters 
these carpenters didn't end up making a, a lot of profit on this house. I find that fact uh, poignant, I suppose, is the word. It's really not an example of the way the, uh, the world ought to work. I suppose people ought to get both spiritual and material rewards for their labor. But of course, a lot don't get either. The point, I think, of this small example is that one effect of technological change is to exact a price from the craftsman person, craftsperson, um, for the privilege of exercising craft. If balloon framing, among other inventions, has led to a diminution of the number and difficulty of the skills needed to build a house, then obviously it has reduced the possibilities for doing work that a person can take pride in for the sort of work that lends meaning to life. But building a house is still tricky and difficult enough that a carpenter can do craftsmanlike work, but not, I think, if the carpenter also wants to be able to afford to live in the kinds of houses he likes to build. Um, let me try to sharpen my focus on the <clears throat> engineers of computer hardware whom I spied on for a while. One young member of that fraternity, and I use the term fraternity advisedly, uh, once told me silicon-based life would have a lot of advantages over carbon-based life. He said a, he believed a time would surely come when the machines would take over. Just like that, he said, and snapped his fingers. He'd been reading too much Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> It was, it was interesting, though, to me, that this pleasant young carbon-based engineer took obvious and immense pleasure in the prospect of his, his own craft leading to his own obsolescence. <laughs> in the real or, or at least observable world of the present, there are any number of instances of such occurrences. One of the engineer's fathers had been a hot metal typesetter. That was a real craft. <clears throat> it has been all but destroyed by computers by the uh, technology that the sun is involved in. I find such information piquant and not wholly regrettable. What is regrettable, at least in my utopian view of what work ought to be, is the, exer is the exercise of craft that leads to no new craft at all, but to the migration of interesting tasks from individuals to systems, tailorism, scientific management, dividing a task into pieces so small <clears throat> that a well-trained monkey could perform any one of them. Taylorism, as I read it, is a crafty solution to problems in production, but at some point I fondly hope it's not productive. When I began the research for the book, I wound up writing about the creation of a computer. I found myself on the subterranean floor of an extremely stark industrial building, a place I called the basement, because nobody had liked it enough to give it a name. <laughs> you know the place, anywhere in industrial USA, laid out in corridors and cubicles, in a pattern familiar to behavioral psychologists and to small, confused mammals. <laughs> I was very skeptical. The, the possibility that anything interesting or graceful could happen there did seem remote. Uh, I met the lieutenants of this team of hardware engineers. <clears throat> One of them, just as soon as I met him, took me to a corner of the cafeteria and started telling me all these amazing things. And it was as if this fellow, who, as I began to learn, was very observant, had been watching a uh, variety of very odd behavior for a long time, and had, in fact, for 10 years, and had been waiting all that time for someone to come along whom he could tell, talk to about it. <laughs> and here's what he told me, more or less, uh, that these engineers, this team of engineers, had been denied the right to build their, this big new machine by their company. Another team had been given that charter and they had resolved to do it anyway, <coughs> to recruit a bunch of brand new graduates out of school, and they called the kids, and you know, do it sort of on the slide. <coughs> there, there was talk of wars and shootouts, big wins, and so on. Realistically, was a term that prefaced many flights of fancy. <coughs> <laughs> and this is really where I got hooked. Hearing this tale, it seemed unusual to me that a that workers in a most frankly commercial setting uh, could get this excited about building a computer, what to me looked like an immobile plastic box. <clears throat> also, it was called a mini computer, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out what in the world that meant. This was, I think, post mini skirt era, and I thought it was kind of an amusing term. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, they were obviously all charged up about building this new immobile plastic box, and they were working 
six day weeks and as often as not 12 hour days, sometimes 16 hour ones. They said things such as, I've had difficult, difficulty forming sentences lately or <clears throat> the last, <laughs> the one female engineer uh, said to me once, uh, the last three times my husband's had to do the laundry, I forget to go home and have dinner. My favorite remark along those lines was from a charming young man who rode a motorcycle, had a beard, said, I love my job, it's great, but outside of work, I, I do other things. I ride my bike, I go rock climbing and hiking. And they looked at me sort of astonished and said, I haven't done any of that for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was relish in their voices, and I wanted to know where that came from. I wanted to know how come, which is sort of the central question in my profession. You know, people rarely do anything for one reason only, but often one reason or one motivation takes precedence. I thought it might be money. Um, the, one of the sub-lieutenants of the hardware side of the team, known as the Hardy Boys, found one day in the wastebasket in the lab a pay stub that uh, one of the technicians had thrown in there. Uh, the technicians are, are supposed to be of lower status than engineers, but they, because they are lower status, they are supposed to get overtime, and engineers don't. Um, he looked at the pay stub, and he realized that this guy was taking home twice as much money as he was <coughs> because of the only overtime they were working. <laughs> so he, he could have, you know, presumably, in, under those sort of circumstances, he could start a little revolution, a little palace revolt, but he took it to his next higher boss, and they spread it over and discussed it, and then they burned it <laughs> so nobody else would see it. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, these guys had some dreams of being heroes. They were told they would be. They were promised stock. But they all seemed skeptical about the, uh, the stock anyway. Um, I'm told that, actually, this is an, it's not easy to figure out who said this first, but it's an old dictum in engineering that the uh, dollar sign is the proper last term in, in any good engineering equation. And this was a decidedly commercial machine. Its virtue was to put money on the bottom line. Uh, but these engineers knew that they weren't going to see much of that. Uh, and really, they, they didn't seem to be working primarily for money. And once you get past that, you've got a natural mystery. Uh, if it's not money or power, um, what could it be? How could you understand Henry Kissinger? <coughs> <Those terms. laughs> I, the, the first clue I think I got at least in my interpretation of these doings, was when um, came when a, uh, one of the most brilliant engineers in the basement who wasn't connected to this team told me that he had a fantasy about a job that would be better than the one he had. Um, and this was that he would go to work for a computer company whose, the, whose, design, the engi whose, whose engineers did a lot of designs that left a lot to be desired, and he would be a janitor. And he would sneak into their offices at night and correct the designs on their blackboards and desks. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realized that, you know, gee, engineers are esthetes. Uh, actually, that's something that scientists have known for a long time. <laughs> Terrible arguments about scientific devices between engineers and scientists, but that's another subject. <laughs> the then there was, there was something I came across called the, which I called the rules of the game. Uh, one was, um, what, what's the earliest date by which you can't prove you won't be finished scheduling? There was another called pinball, I'll get back to that. Uh, there was one called signing up, which was a kind of collectivization. The idea being that you, if you agreed to do part of this machine, you'd agree to do whatever was necessary to get it done and including, you know, just ruin your life. <laughs> peer pressure, as it was called, um, by, which was defined as follows. If I screw this up, I'll be the only one, and I'm not going to be the only one. I think for the, the young recruits, it was a little bit like graduate school. Um, one, one young engineer got assigned a job of low priority uh, for about six months, started to feel wretched because everyone else was working so hard. He got offered a chance to do some grueling work and, and says, I, he said, I, I jumped on it, really, which is sort of an updated version of Tom Sawyer's fence. <laughs> their, their chief administrator, um, the, only, sorry, the 
there wasn't much female presence. She was just about, not, not all there was, but most of it, uh, said that she felt she was doing something important. The head of the Hardy Boys uh, said he was doing it because he wanted to find out what he was worth. The uh, tough-talking computer architect, the most amusing fellow, I think wanted revenge for canceled projects and wanted a little tangible success. He designed about, I don't know, four or five computers that he thought were really nifty and they'd never gotten to see the light of day. As for the leader of the group, West uh, seemed to me to be a law unto himself, which was the main reason, reason why the lieutenant of the micro coders, the micro kids, a guy named Alsing was participating. He was there to figure out what, why West was participating. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of manipulation too. Um, I, I guess the best story about that was the young man who had to build a part of the machine that needed to be done before any other part of the machine could be uh, worked on. And his boss asked him how long it would take him to do it. And he said, I think he said something like six weeks. I said, six weeks? He said, four weeks? <clears throat> boss said, all right. You know. He went back to his office. He worked day and night. And it was really coming along very nicely. He went a few days later to his boss and said, gee, Ed, I think I'll be done in two weeks. And his boss looked at him and smiled and said, oh, good. <laughs> he went back to his office and he said, God, I just signed up to do it in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a <clears throat> sort of frontier approach to the management of that project. That West used any, anything that came to hand, including me. <clears throat> I, at one point, one of the young micro kids said to me, well, I know what we're doing must be important if there's a writer covering it. And I told West that, and he laughed and laughed. <clears throat> it made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> anyway, he did whatever he, whatever he thought might be necessary, and then some to make it seem exciting, not to turn what might have been a pretty, pretty ordinary toil into an adventure. Um, also, there was a technique of management working there, I think, uh, that, that ran against the drift of Taylorism, which uh, might describe as follows, be nasty, but give everyone a meaningful piece of the machine to do, give everyone some real responsibility. Um, now, mind you, this wasn't everyone's idea of a good time. There, was, there were a number of very talented young engineers who dropped out of the project midstream. And uh, West used to wonder, he'd say, maybe they're the smart ones. You know. um, one, my favorite of those guys, brilliant young engineer who's doing just fine now, I think. Uh, just couldn't stand dealing with nanoseconds anymore. I mean, not with this machine. It's driving me crazy. And, um, you know, billions of a s things that operate in billions of a second. And when he, not long before he quit, he left a note on his uh, computer console which said, I'm going to a commune in Vermont and will deal with no unit of time shorter than a season. <laughs> So what happened? They built, they did it. They built their machine in record time. It actually went out the company's door. In fact, <clears throat> probably saved saved what, a, a for, that Fortune 500 company from real financial chaos. <clears throat> it's, um, the stock options were then a long time in coming, uh, and they were hardly generous when they came. At least in the the first year or two afterward, um, the team was disbanded. All of the managers except for West left the company, some of them feeling not only unappreciated, but even punished for what they'd done. There were lots of explanations for that. That, I mean, it wasn't an intentional piece of mismanagement. Um, and to some degree, to be honest, I have to say that the ones who stuck around got, have gotten rewarded since then pretty handsomely, I gather. But where it ended for me was you know, on that rather sour note. Um, I wondered if I could tell you what it all means. You could say that it shows how eagerly engineers participate in screwing themselves. <laughs> I, I, I really think there's some truth to that. I'm not, I'm not arguing that engineers ought to form a union, but it's interesting to contemplate what such a union might, might be like. It might even be honest. <laughs> um, be a tremendously powerful union, but it'll never happen. 
because every engineer is encouraged to think that he's a potential president of the, uh, the company he's working for or some other one that he'll start. Um, I think there's another issue that's connected to this and that has to do with the obsolescence of engineers, particularly in an industry like the computer one. Uh, young engineers come out of school um, and they're cheaper. And that technology changes quickly. A uh, seasoned engineer really, best education for a fellow who wants to stay in that business for a fair amount of time would be in the natural sciences. Acquire the ability to, to keep up with this stuff because the young guys coming out of school know far more than uh, the people who've been working building computers for two or three years, far more technically anyway. Um, and I think it's, that's a very big problem for the industry. There are all kinds of, I'm told, computer engineers who are pumping gas <coughs> have gone to literal communes. Uh, also, maybe uh, another moral of the story is that there's a price to be paid for exciting work. <coughs> I'm not suggesting that it should be this way. Um, I think engineers like carpenters should have money and spiritual rewards, but I don't think that that's the way the world works for most people just now. <coughs> that team wasn't quite Darwinian. It wasn't quite managed red and tooth and claw. Uh, I think that was clearest when one very aggressive young engineer told me that the uh, whole thing was to compete with each other <coughs> as vigorously as possible, but if someone got knocked down, you had to build him up again <coughs> and really do a good job of that so that you could compete with him some more. <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, certainly dangers in this kind of job. One may be that you never quite get to repeat the excitement of it and don't really want to. Um, there's another one, which is that kind of a world gets very narrow, very cloistered, almost monastic, I think. Um, and one of the ways I think that showed was that most, well, many of these people had a real, really lacked knowledge about the consequences of their labor. Some didn't care uh, very cheerfully <laughs> and said such things as, you know, we say that the ultimate purpose of building a machine is to have it run a multi-programming reliability test. Um, <laughs> And sort of by the way, one of them, one told me that he, he really didn't like working on uh, weapon systems. He had worked on the guidance system for the ABM. I think it was the ABM. Anyway, he didn't like the missile, but he loved working on its complex electronic innards. <coughs> um, others felt very strongly about this issue of working on weapons. Um, all, however, were powerless. I'm not sure it's ever been very uh, different. I'm not sure it can be. I think that the people who make things rarely have control over how they're used. Um, certainly a computer, if it's well designed, can be used for absolutely pernicious chores and for silly ones and even some useful ones. Um, I don't myself like all of the ways in which I <coughs> computers are used or promise to be used. I think mainly sometimes uh, there's a, a tendency kind of grows out of them to quantify everything. Um, and I don't hold any brief for that computer company or any other computer company. But I did come away feeling in spite of all my pre-existing attitudes about work in America, about engineering, I always thought all engineers were nerds, you know. <laughs> there were those. Nerd packs, nerd packs. <laughs> Actually, I think I'll get one of those one of these days. My carpenter said I followed maybe one out of wood. <laughs> but nothing fits in it. Um, and about engineering that, I, that I'd watched, I did come away feeling that I'd watched something oddly inspiring. In my book, I talked about John Ruskin. I think rather unfortunately, um, he wrote about, he had this theory that the great medieval cathedrals of Europe, that in them you could see the emblem of free labor given freely. Well, not too much is known about medieval buildings, I now know. <laughs> uh, but it does appear that Ruskin, <coughs> that, that, that labor wasn't organized to build those cathedrals in the way Ruskin wished it had been. <laughs> That's still his, his, um, his argument for uh, a kind of free labor is, is moving and and I think he was one of the first 
interesting thinkers to, to point out that you could judge thing that human beings had built not only according to how it looked, how it operated, but also according to the conditions under which it was 